Hi, welcome to EuroRec 101. There are many, many videos out there about EuroRack modules and in-depth EuroRack techniques and so forth, but what is EuroRack? What if you're new to this? What if you don't know even where to start? Um, it, it's, it can be daunting. There are hundreds of manufacturers and literally thousands of EuroRack modules out there. Um, so it's important to back up and let's understand why they're even there in the first place. Um, this takes a little bit of history and it involves a technology that I would call analog synthesis, analog music synthesis. Um, analog music synthesis really started back in the days of early radio when they were developing transmitters and receivers. And people started noticing that they'd hear these funny sounds come out of the speakers on the radios. Most of these were caused by something called an oscillator circuit. Oscillator is absolutely essential to a radio transmitter or a receiver. So what is this oscillator? Why does it affect what we think of when we think of this? Well, these early inventions came along using oscillators in the audio bandwidth, things that humans could hear, through, usually through speakers. Um, and, you know, some of these inventions like the teleharmonic instrument that was installed in teleharmonic call in New York a little after the turn of the 20th century, um, it used mainly uh, magnetic wheels, which eventually became the Hammond organ type of technology, um, to create these oscillations electronic oscillations which were brought out into the hall. This instrument was played, it was an enormous instrument, and it was quite interesting. And then that led on to some other inventions. A uh, notable one is the theremin. It was invented by Leo Theremin, who was a Russian uh, inventor and popularized actually by his daughter who played it. Um, it was also an oscillator-based instrument. And the way you controlled this thing, because controlling this stuff was what was so critical, um, the way you controlled a theremin was interesting. It had an antenna, and um, two antennas actually, and one of them, the closer you got to it, it would modify the pitch. The other one, it would modify the volume. So you could build these really interesting sounds out of the theremin. Um, a somewhat later record that came along that popularized the sound of the theremin was the Beach Boys Good Vibration song. That's a classic theremin sound. It's also used in a lot of horror movies to get that kind of wobbly woo kind of thing that we hear a lot of times in horror movies. Um, it too was born out of this oscillator technology and let me show you an oscillator like we would use on a test bench to test audio gear. The function generator has the ability to produce tones, uh, various tones, sine waves, square waves, we'll talk more about those in a minute, um, at any pitch that you decide by adjusting it on the front panel. This one has a knob, and uh, if you wanted to have a test tone at, say, one kilohertz, 1,000 cycles per second, you can set it to that, and then you have that tone which you can use. Then we get into the 1960s, late 50s, 1960s, and two inventors of note, um, Bob Moog and, and Don Buchla, embrace the idea of controlling their modules, their oscillators, their things that produce sound with voltage. Now this had a lot of benefits. Voltage control gave people the ability to change things in a variety of ways because voltage can be generated not just from a battery, but also it can be controlled with resistive networks and so forth and so on. A keyboard like this key step um, is able to produce voltage which changes depending on which key you press. The higher you go up the keyboard, the higher the voltage is going to generate. Bob Moog decided that one volt per octave would be a pretty good standard for how to set up some kind of rational scheme for controlling pitch of oscillators with keyboards, ribbon controllers, even eventually guitars and other things. So this voltage control idea was giving everybody a lot of capability to control these different modules that were being built. So how does this work exactly? This is an oscillator, and if we bring a voltage control up from our keyboard, let's turn it on. We can plug it in, and the voltage control is input. And now, we can change the pitch by playing different notes on the keyboard. So now we can 
So now we have the ability to do keyboard control, which is really powerful. Um, and depending on the keyboard controller, what type of controller it is, it can offer you different options. Um, this one has quite a few effects in it, like arpeggiation, and also the ability to sequence a pattern of notes. You can pre-play a note pattern into it and it will play it back. Um, so these are some of the techniques that are available to you in, in voltage control with these modules. As we got into the 1970s and beyond, regular keyboards, these, these synthesizer keyboards became more popular. So con companies like Yamaha and Roland and those guys took over. Um, it was much easier for a performer on stage to operate one of these keyboards, particularly with the presets that were in it and the preset sounds that were available, than it was to deal with voltage control and patching and all of that. But something kind of interesting happened. As history marched on, performers began to ask the question, can I make my own sounds? Can I use something other than what's in this keyboard to actually play music? And the answer, of course, was yes. Um, analog keyboards, analog synthesis never really went anywhere. It was back there in the background being used by people in recording studios, sound designers, and film, and, and so forth. They, they loved their analog devices because they could make totally original sounds with them, um, thanks to voltage control. So. Time marched on, and it became harder and harder to find these older instruments. Finally, um, about 15, 20 years ago, um, a man, Dieter Dofer in Germany, decided that he would come out with a new realization of the older technology available in some analog synthesizers. Now, what was interesting is Dieter realized we need to make this inexpensive so musicians can afford it. The old synthesizers that were built by Bob Moog and Buchla were expensive devices and only universities and people in the motion picture business that had big, big uh, salaries or big companies behind them could afford them. So he wanted to make this available for everybody and certainly electronics had gotten a lot cheaper. It's a lot easier to design and build your own stuff. So he came out with a different set of specifications, a standard if you will, that embraced all the ideas from Moog and Buchla and those and their contemporaries and brought them into a new form factor, which is what we call Eurorack. Eurorack is somewhat standardized. The, the different standards or specifications that Dieter put out were, were fairly straightforward. The height is what we call three units high, and this relates to standard racks that are used for rack equipment that bands and recording studios and video studios use. Um, and this spacing is 128.5 millimeters high. Now, that's the standard height of a module. Most modules are built by simply taking a faceplate and affixing some electronics to the back of it, giving the user some knobs and some patch points to reach through the 3.5 millimeter jacks on the front panel. In other words, these are jacks that are places for audio to go in and out. They're also places for voltage to go in to control the module. We use a shortcut term for this voltage. We call it control voltage, which some people refer to as CV. So you'll hear the term CV a lot. So 128.5 millimeters high, but the width, Dieter decided to let the user or the designer of the circuit make decide the width. It's measured in horizontal position points here. And each horizontal position is about five millimeters, slightly more. Uh, and that determines the width of a module. So if you have a really complex module with a lot of pieces, parts to it, you can have a much wider HP, like this DOP module from Make Noise right here, it's, um, it's a nice wide module. Whereas you can have other modules that are extremely small. I don't, can you see this one? Okay. Um, this one is only 4 HP wide. So this is very small, 20 millimeters wide, a little more. And that's it. Now the other parts of the specification 
are the power for these modules because these modules plug in with little cables that connect to the motherboard back here, the screen motherboard through these pins. And those pins provide power for each Eurorack module. Um, in this skiff, we call it here, there's enough power available at the motherboard to usually control a whole complement of modules wide enough to fill the whole skiff. However, some modules are power hungry and you need to check them and make sure they're not drawing too much current because you can't exceed the specifications if you have too many power hungry modules in one skiff. So to connect these, you need to get the little cable. There's gonna be a red marker usually on the side of the cable that will denote the negative voltage. So that's what connects to the negative voltage. And you plug this in and this will give you plus 12 volts, minus 12 volts, and five volts. Five volts is usually used for the logic if there is a little computer chip or some kind of digital logic in your particular module that needs that voltage or some smaller voltage than that, usually 3.3 volts. Um, so that is the basics. That's what is in this. So another specification that Dieter Dauffer offered in his and his Eurorack specifications was to add a clock signal to the motherboard. So on this motherboard, there is a pin on here that you can put clock signals down. And that can be helpful when you have two modules such as these, uh, Maleco Heavy Industries modules, that are connected to one another uh, via clocking. So whatever you set up on this module, can go over to this module. Another nice thing is that this module is capable of saving its presets to the master module over here by, because of that bus. So having that little data bus is handy, but other than these things I've mentioned, there are no other specifications for Eurorack to speak of. Well, thanks for watching, and I hope you are interested enough in what we're talking about here to join us for Eurorack 101 episode 2 where we're going to talk about more voltage control things, sequencers, which are very interesting voltage control modules, and also gates and clocks. We're going to be talking about those things. Um, gates and clocks are a different kind of signal other than voltage control and they're very, very useful, particularly with percussion sounds and also just trying to control things in the Eurorack world. So please stick around or join us for that class. Please remember that this is part of a, of a curriculum that was developed for the AMPT program at VCU, which stands for Advanced Media Production and Technology. Um, those classes teach people in modern technology and how to use them with making media, like music, for example. So, take care.